from Houston, Texas, a member of the Corps of Cadets and Squadron 17. More importantly, I'm a proud member of the Fight for State class of 2021. Woo! Hey, hey, hey! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give y'all a brief little, little history about College Station and how the school started, and also you're probably wondering who the heck we are, so I'm going to tell you about that. So first of all, College Station uh, is named what it is for the college that was founded back in 1876. That's when Texas A&M was founded. Um, it's called College Station because there was actually a, a predominant train station that was here. So there was a train running through and so they named it College Station. Um, well, back in the day in 1876, Texas A&M was founded as a military school. Um, it was focused on uh, agri agricultural uh, and mechan it was a mechanical college. Um, and so the, the young leaders, uh, who we are, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of history on that. So we got started back in 1907. Back when Texas a was at all male military school. <laughs> so I see some confused faces, so let me explain. When we disagree with something here at Texas a and we never boo, because we are far too classy for that. <laughs> so instead we hiss, and we call it a horse's laugh. So when I say that Texas A&M was all male cried out, there we go. I mean that we didn't have any of the fine, beautiful ladies walking around campus like we do today. <laughs> so the way that we would get our dates back in the day is that they would come in on the train from a, the Texas Women's College in Denton, Texas, and all of the cadets would rush on over to the train station and line up in rank order, from seniors, juniors, sophomores, and naturally the freshmen were always in the back. Well, if you were a junior or senior, you are pretty much always guaranteed a date. And if you had to be a pretty good looking sophomore, unlike Carson over here. <laughs> and if you were a freshman, you might as well just grab your buddy's hand and go marching back to the dorm because you were not going to get a day. Well, back in 1907, our football team was doing really well. In fact, it had been three straight years since they lost a single home football game. And as crazy as this sounds, the days of those juniors and seniors were getting tired of coming down to college station for another predictable Aggie win. Well, the juniors and seniors couldn't have that, so they put their heads together and they sent five freshmen down on the Kyle Field, which you saw right over there. Same Kyle Field, uh, just a little bit smaller back in the day. And they sent those freshmen on the field to provide some entertainment. Well, those freshmen ran on the field, and before they did, they grabbed the goofiest looking things they could find five white janitor's uniforms. And let me let you in on a little secret here. Texas A&M, if something happens once, it's a coincidence. But if it happens twice, then it's a tradition. <laughs> and so those freshmen ran on the field acting crazy, whooping, hollering, and some even say that the first Aggie yell was led that day. Well, it went over well. In fact, a little too well. What happened was that the dates of those juniors and seniors started trying to go down to Kyle Field to meet those five freshmen. <laughs> And so the position quickly got changed to three seniors and two juniors, which it still is today. Now, the role and job of an Aggie Yale leader has changed quite a bit. Today, it is a student body elected position that serves to promote and perpetuate Aggie athletics, spirit, and tradition. And we do this by attending all home and away football games, men's and women's basketball, soccer, volleyball, our new student orientations, as well as coaches' nights, and then our freshman camps in the summer. Um, and our personal favorite is the Aggie Moms Club. Woo! <laughs> well, it's a very busy job, but it's a great way to give back to the university that we love and hold so dear. So that's a little bit about our tradition, and now I'm going to turn it over to Carson. Thanks, and dig them. Howdy! My name is Carson Love, and I'm a senior industrial distribution major from San Antonio, Texas. Remember the core cadets and company E2, but more importantly, I'm proud member of the Fighting Texas Aggie class of 2020. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Keller told you a little bit about the history of the university and who the Yell leaders are, but that doesn't really tell you what a Yell is. So I'm about to teach you today uh, what a Yell is and how to do a Yell, so pay close attention. So by a quick show of hands, who here is familiar with what a Yell is and or has ever done a Yell? Oh, this is going to be a fun one. <laughs> well, it's really easy. You don't really have too terribly much to worry about because there's just four basic parts. Now, the first part of the L is called the pass back. And all the pass back is, is it's a simple hand motion we do 
to let everyone know what yell we're about to do. So for instance, for the yell gigum, you should take your thumb like this and say, pass it back, guys. And then everyone around you will copy that hand motion. That way, when we're in Kyle Field, the three decks, the people from the bottom all the way to the top can know exactly what yell we're about to do. Now, the second part of the yell is called the humpet. Bear with me, bear with me, it sounds bad as it sounds. All the humpet is is the Aggie engineer who made the best projector boards. Now, Texas a and spent a lot of time and, well, money making this, so be sure to use it. So my buddy Keller is going to show you what the humpet looks like. So this is, so in Kyle Field, just to give y'all a little bit of, like, Perspective. So all of the students will say hump and ads and everyone will get right here in this humpet position. It's the best way to project your voice. So that's so it. That's that's it. So <laughs> we'll slap the rebels and say hump and ads and everyone will just get down that hump and ready position. And they'll stay there for the remainder of the yell itself. Now the third part of the yell is, well, the yell and we got some words and goofy looking hand motions that go with that, but we'll get to that here in a second. Now the fourth and final part of the yell is called the wildcat. Now, the Wildcat is very special here at Texas a and mainly for two reasons. First, it shows that the yell has, well, come to an end. But second, and more importantly, it gives every Aggie a chance to show off a little bit of class pride. Now, you saw Keller and I do our Wildcats earlier, but we're going to go through them really quickly. So when you show up, bright-eyed Bushy Taylor here at Texas a and campus as a freshman, the freshmen are new here, and they're walking around wondering, man, this place is big. Where's my next class? When's my next class? And if they're anything like me and Keller, they're probably wondering, are we even going to go to our next class? <laughs> <laughs> so we got to keep things nice and simple for them. So for a freshman after the yell, so I'm going to do the freshman wildcat. Keller's going to show you just yeah, that. So way. after the yell is complete, freshman here at Texas A&M will go like this. Hey! Really simple. That's it. So they'll just throw their hands up in the air and yell A. So that's the freshman wildcat. Now this brings us to our sophomores. You see, sophomores have been here a whole two semesters and they got that under their belt and they think they're hot shots so we make things a little bit more complicated for them. So for our sophomores what you're going to do is do a pistol one in each hand and A down the ground five times. So this is what the sophomore wildcat looks like. Hey, 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 hey! One more. Hey! <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm not a math major. <laughs> now this brings us to our juniors and junior year is actually a very special time here in Aggie Land because it's like Aggie's first chance to woo. And guys, I know this sounds crazy, but Aggies literally wait two years to say the word boo. <laughs> so, for that junior wildcat, what you're going to do is make a pistol with your right hand, hopefully where that Aggie ring will be one day. You're going to cover it with your left hand, A down to the ground three times, and then whip down. My buddy Keller's going to show you what that looks like. Just like this. Hey, hey, hey! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so nice and easy. Now, this brings us to our, uh, our seniors here. You see, our seniors have been here a while. They've been here for a well, while. Three, four, five, <laughs> six, maybe even seven years if you're on the same degree plan we're on. So we gotta keep it nice and simple for them. So for our seniors, what you do is you interdigitate your fingers. That's right, I said interdigitate. <laughs> Eight and you grab one time and whoop up above your head and hide from your left leg behind your right hand. So this is what the senior wildcat looks like. Hey! <laughs> and so those are your wildcats. So now that y'all know kind of generally what the parts are, we're going to run through really quickly just what a yell looks like, and then we're going to have you all participate. We're going to do it together. Does that sound good? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, as we said earlier, the pass back to the yell gigum looks like just like this. You don't have to do it yet. But uh, so now here's what the yell looks like. So we go one, two, three.
performer spot. Now, a path back performer spot looks just like this. It's the best with each hand to rotate twice forward and twice backwards. So that's the pass back. Now here's the yell. Now one thing to know with this one is you got 50-50 shot at it. You either yell farmers or you yell fight. One, two, three. Farmers fight. Farmers fight. 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 Farmers, farmers, fight. Hey. Now that's the yell farmers fight. Now we're going to teach you one more yell today. And guys, let me tell you. This is Aggie Land's personal favorite yell. Affectionately called Beat the Hell. Now the pass back for Beat the Hell looks just like this. I know guys, it's uh, pretty edgy for here in College Station. But what we use the yell Beat the Hell for is, well, really anything. Beat the hell out of tests, beat the hell out of breast games, or beat the hell out of your opponent. It's just our way to all rally together behind a common cause and beat the hell out of something, because, well, it's fun. So anyways, this is the pass back. Now here's the L. One, two, three. Beat the hell out of whoever we're playing that week. Hey! <laughs> Woo! So now that you guys all know generally what the L's are, everyone get on your feet, let's have ourselves a fight and take that out practice. <laughs>
So since I do not have the requisite uh, uniform, hopefully you already clued into the fact that I will not be making that same sort of performance. <laughs> <clears throat> so good morning, first of all. Uh, I'm David Carlson, Dean of University Libraries at Texas A&M. Uh, in addition, I currently serve as President of the Board of Directors of the Open Library Foundation. And I'd like, I'd like to welcome you to WolfCon, to College Station, and to the campus of Texas A&M University. I want to begin with a few opening remarks. When I talk with colleagues who don't know, what, uh, in, who don't know about LLF, and ask what it is or what it does, I talk about several things. First, I stress that OLF is nothing more and nothing less than a gathering of communities. These communities have shared interests around the development of open source software and tools that enables researchers and libraries to achieve their missions. Tools that are developed by us and for us. We believe that while each of the communities in OLF are unique, we know that we can learn and benefit from each other a great deal. So one important goal of OLF is sharing. Sharing technology and tools, yes, but also sharing ideas, insights, and experience that will enable us to achieve greater things. There are many challenges in the development of open source software. The most obvious are the ones we talk about most, money and development time and expertise. These are important to be sure, but we've had enough success with open source projects to know that there are deeper issues. And yes, this means deeper challenges, but I'm encouraged because this shows a maturity of our work. If we want to have impact beyond 1.0, we must address sustainability. The old measure of success was pretty simple. Did it work? But the deeper questions are things like, once the excitement of a new app has faded, how do we ensure that we incorporate new standards, new technologies, and new functional requirements, requirements moving forward? How do we designate and protect the integrity of what we call canonical code? And questions about community. When everyone can get a copy of the software freely and use it freely, how do we define community? And once defined, how does that community manage itself? How does it accept gifts, pay bills, and make decisions? I don't have all the answers to those questions, but the Open Library Foundation provides a place and a forum where we can explore those questions and begin to find and create solutions collaboratively as a community. So when you registered and picked up your conference materials, including the all-important t-shirts, you should have received a small paperback book. And if you didn't, uh, there are more copies out there on the table. I encourage you to pick one up. This book is an anthology of poetry by Dudley Randall titled The Black Poets. And when you saw it at registration, I expect some questions may have entered your mind like, is this WolfCon or did I stumble into the MLA convention? <laughs> Let me explain. The book is a gift to all attendees from the A&M libraries. In this audience, I suspect I am not the only one who enjoys listening to NPR. I especially enjoy listening to the arts and culture show Fresh Air, which features host Terry Gross. Terry conducts extended interviews with writers, actors, musicians, politicians, really anyone who has an interesting story to tell. My only regret is that I miss more broadcasts than I hear, but whenever I get a chance to listen, I find the programs are consistently interesting, engaging, and thoughtful. In December of 2015, Mr. Gross had Reginald Dwayne Betts on her show. Mr. Betts is an African-American poet and writer. He won acclaim for his poetry and memoir collections, which explore themes of race, access to wealth, or the lack thereof, incarceration, and the war on drugs. Betts grew up in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C., where he was an honor student in his high school class. But he spent eight years in prison as a teenager and young adult for a carjacking that he participated in when he was 16. 
Some 14 months of that sentence was spent in solitary confinement. While in prison, books became Mr. Betts's mental escape. He read anything and everything he could get his hands on. In his interview on Fresh Air, Mr. Betts tells the following story, quote, in solitary confinement, you couldn't have books, and you couldn't request books, and you couldn't go to the library. But people would somehow find ways to get books into their cells. So it would be this rotating cycle of books that existed in solitary confinement. One afternoon, I asked for a book and said, can somebody send me a book? And somebody slid a book under my cell door. To this day, I have no idea who sent it to me, but it was an anthology by Dudley Randall. It was called The Black Poets, and that's the book that changed my life." Unquote. Mr. Betts had never read much poetry before, but in reading that book, he saw himself and his life reflected. It inspired him to write his own poetry. And after being released from prison, he completed his education and wrote more poetry, eventually getting published to great acclaim. Most recently, he graduated with a law degree from Yale Law School and has put his writing skills to work in the quest for justice for incarcerated youth. You now have a copy of the book that changed Mr. Betz's life. An inspiring story, but what's it got to do with WolfCon? Well, let me begin by stressing that I do not want to suggest that any, any parallels between solitary confinement and open source software development. <laughs> <clears throat> there may be some, but no, we have distributed this book with several other aspirations. First, we, we hope it will be a good and helpful reminder to you of the value of our work. What we do enables discovery and access to resources that have the capacity to transform lives. So when you're furious with bugs, whose fixes seem to just create more bugs, when you are worried by expenses that exceeds budgets, when, if you're a dean and everyone is telling you that we can't possibly go to production with Folio this summer, I encourage you, see he's laughing, he knows why I said that. <laughs> uh, I encourage you at these times to pause, take a moment, look up at your book shelf, and remind yourself of the story behind this book. Remember that the tools you are helping to build do nothing less than enable the transformative power of reading discovery, and that changes lives. Second, I hope this, this book brings some perspective to your work. Did anyone notice some missing elements in Mr. Betz's story? There was no librarian. There was no discovery search engine, not even EDS. There was a rudimentary kind of interlibrary loan service, but nothing like we hope to see in ReShare. The book that transformed Mr. Betts was delivered to him anonymously by someone he did not know and without any initiative from him other than the simple, I need a book. So yes, what we do is important. But as we build our sophisticated systems and services, we need to remember that sometimes the best thing we can do is just get out of the way of our users. We need to allow them to roam and discover as freely as they may want on one day and on another day to identify, drill down, and search. Finally, I hope you appreciate the non-traditional nature of this book. It is a book of poetry, a genre that today's publishers publish very little of. And not only is it poetry, it's poetry by black poets. And I am reminded that earlier this week, we celebrated Martin Luther King Day. The voices in this book are ones we often overlook. So I hope this book is not just a symbolic reminder of the value of our work, but I also hope it's a book you actually take a look at and read. It's our hope that you take some time, perhaps in the plane on your way home, to hear the voices it liberates, and perhaps it will affect your work as well. So on behalf of Texas A&M University, I want to welcome you to the campus and welcome you to WolfCon. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Ginny Boyer. Ginny is the executive director of the Open Library Foundation. Ginny will talk about some housekeeping details for our meeting and introduce our plenary speaker.
introduce this guy in a moment. So howdy. 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 Yes. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Jenny Boyer, and as the executive director of the Open Library Foundation, I too would like to welcome you to College Station and to WolfCon 2020. Your participation makes this conference a possibility and a success, and we hope that it is a productive time for you here. Beyond you each individually, I'm grateful for the, the participation and inclusion of the OLF project communities here at WolfCon. That includes ViewFind, Folio, GoKB, ReShare, Olay, and Coral. We're honored to host you and appreciative of your support for the foundation. The OLF serves as an administrative and collaborative home to these open source communities of practice. Your work furthers our mission to assist and facilitate educational organizations and diverse partnerships that develop and sustain open technologies for libraries, learning, research, and teaching. To you all, we thank you for being here and for your belief and support of this good work. With that, I will share uh, some housekeeping notes that will help you to navigate the conference and we'll let you know what to expect here in the coming days. But first of all, I would like to extend a thanks to David um, and the Texas A&M Libraries for being our host here for WolfCon 2020. So just a round of applause for them having us. This is a beautiful location. Um, I'd also like to thank our conference sponsors for helping to facilitate this, uh, this conference. That includes the Olay Partner Libraries, EBSCO, Index Data, and Archivum. Thanks to you all for helping to support this meeting. Um, you will note in our program, we do have a general session which is open and available to everyone. This meeting is also intended to accommodate various working meetings for the different projects that are here represented. Uh, for the general session, those presentations are of general interest and we hope that you will attend these when you are not pr uh, presenting or participating in your project specific meetings. Please note that project working meetings are for members of the existing projects primarily. If you have a question about participating in any of those, it would be best to identify someone within that community to ask. Wolfie, if you're wondering why I'm carrying around a stuffed animal, this is Wolfie. He is our conference mascot. He was with us in 2018. He is here again in 2020. Um, he made an appearance, an appearance earlier this week on the Foundation's Twitter feed leading up to the conference. Um, we are going to be, uh, we'll have Wolfie around the conference this week and we hope that you will seek him out. If you would like to take a selfie with him, if you are tweeting, <laughs> post this on uh, Twitter with hashtag WolfCon20. The Foundation's marketing team will choose one of these selfies from our feed and the person who posted it will win a prize. Please have fun with it. Wolfie's adorable. Um, and this is intended to be a lighthearted meeting. So help us to participate and um, seek Wolfie out, if you will. <coughs> Wi-Fi details can be found in the WolfCon Slack channel. They've been posted there. Um, in addition to, there are small pieces of paper on all of the rounds, on all of the tables in the rooms um, to allow you to get online for this meeting. If you have any problems, please let us know. Each meeting room has also been provisioned with a Zoom channel. The information is printed out and will be in that room. The person running the session is responsible for sharing the Zoom information with the folks who are attending the meeting and for initiating the Zoom at the start of the meeting. Uh, this is to facilitate virtual participation for those that could not join us today. If you signed up for headshots or are interviewing for a video, the Wolf Den is located on the second floor in the Honor Ballroom. If you have not signed up for either of these and have interest in doing so, uh, please find a staff member. I will indicate who those staff members are, uh, or you can come to the registration desk during its operating hours to sign up for one of those slots. We'd love to accommodate you if you have an interest in doing that. We do have an AV crew that is filming, uh, doing filming and social media throughout the conference. They will be walking around taking photographs and taking videos. If you do not want to be photographed uh, or filmed for use by the foundation, 
please feel free to let us know that and to notify the person who is doing that AV work and we will be happy to honor your wishes. On your table, there is a hotel information report card. We would be grateful if you would fill that out for us. There are some odd fields on there, so just do what you can. Uh, it, is, it is something the hotel has asked us to do, and we would be grateful if you could assist with that. Once completed, please just leave them on the table, and we will walk around and collect them at the end of our day today. Uh, tomorrow evening, uh, A&M is hosting a reception for us on behalf of the conference. It will be hosted in the same space where our meals will be located. Please be sure to attend and fill up. Patrick wanted to let everyone know there will be a lot of food. Um, heavy hors d'oeuvres is an understatement, so don't feel like you need to go out for dinner afterwards. There will be lots of good food, drinks, and entertainment. So please join us and intend to stay and, and have a good time. Uh, the restrooms are located just outside of the ballroom on the right as well as throughout the conference. We thought that was helpful to point out. Um, I want to also introduce our WolfCon staff team. This is the exact same team that planned this, this conference, which is a massive undertaking. Please give them a high five uh, because there's a lot of work that went into doing this. Um, I'm going to ask them, some are standing, but I'm going to ask them to stand up. These are the individuals where if you have a problem, if you have a question, uh, please seek us out. I am one of those individuals. We do have staff indicated on our name tags, as well as a wolf paw. Um, in addition to myself, Kate Waldron, who is standing here on the side, is a staff member. Uh, Patrick Zinn, standing beside Kate. Steph Buck, here and Rachel Fadlin besides Steph. So we are here to help you in any way. Uh, please seek us out if you have any, uh, if, you, if you need us at all. The Open Library Foundation is accepting an interim code of conduct for WolfCon. This code of conduct is linked on the WolfCon page. And here to offer an outline of the code and the reporting process is Peter Murray. Peter, would you like to join us? Yes. Thanks, Ginny. Uh, there is an interim code of conduct in effect for WolfCon. Uh, the purpose of the code of conduct is to make this a uh, productive space for everyone in the community. And the code of conduct community support volunteers uh, are here to help facilitate that. Uh, the community support volunteers, if uh, they are in the room, they could maybe stand or raise their hand. Uh, Steph Buck, Jen Colt, Chris Halberg, Damian Katz, Ian Walls, and Sharon Wiles Young. Uh, we've, uh, as a group of community support volunteers, have done a little training. We're here to help uh, facilitate uh, people participating in this meeting. Uh, if you do encounter something that you need to report, uh, there's an email address, conduct-report at openlibraryfoundation.org, and a website with a form. Uh, that's conduct-report.openlibraryfoundation.org. And if you go to that second URL, uh, there's a link there that has the text of the Code of Conduct itself. And thank you for making this a productive meeting for everybody participating. Thank you to Peter. At this point, I'd like to introduce our plenary speaker, Aviva Weinraub. She joins us from the University of Buffalo Libraries as the new vice provost. She will be discussing barriers to open source software adoption and community building. Identifying some of the systemic structures that are holding us back and exploring more productive pathways forward. Please join me in welcoming Aviva and kicking off WolfCon 2020. So I'm apparently supposed to say howdy. 
<laughs> Howdy. <laughs> Um, I do, in fact, use the word y'all, but um, I'm not actually from the South, uh, but that's okay. Do you need that? I do not. Okay. I am not sliding it up today. Um, okay. So, uh, my name is Aviva Weinraub. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm going to start this talk out today by talking a little bit about myself. This isn't a job talk. So I'm not gonna bore you with you know, the retelling of my CV. I'm gonna to talk to you about how I got into open source in the first place. Actually, I'm gonna start back a bit further and tell you how I got into technology work. It was the mid 90s and I suddenly find myself trying to figure out how to pay for my last year of university. My university offered one free class and a second at 90% off if you were an employee. So I applied for a bunch of jobs and became the office manager in the computer science department. I did the thankless work of putting together POs, handling travel requests, which included calling people on the telephone, um, and um, compiling tenure dossiers, you know, things like that. So it paid my rent and it paid my tuition, and I honestly didn't think much of it. I had been playing around for a while with computers and had built one of the very first websites waxing poetic on the genius of Salman Rushdie. And I didn't think I had any particular facility or understanding of technology. I wasn't a computer science major. I studied history and anthropology. I didn't see myself being part of this emerging space. It wasn't until the Unix sysadmin for the department, a man named Lars Kellogg Stedman, asked me to help him network the 17 sun machines one of our faculty members had just gotten in for a research project that I had any indication that I had a facility with something that was new and transformative. I didn't know then that the interest I had in computers meant anything. Honestly, I didn't realize that I had an affinity for computers or technology beyond anyone else. But I did, and that said, it wasn't until I was in graduate school and someone pointed out to me that I had an understanding and a facility with explaining technology that I even realized that IT was an area that I could work within in a library context. Now, my first job out of library school was like a dream and like a nightmare. <laughs> so I was working at Yale on a joint project with multiple UN agencies. It was like someone had walked into my brain and written a job description just for me. I would come into work and be told to do things like build a reverse proxy system. I had no idea what a proxy system was, let alone how to reverse it. But, you know, I didn't know who to talk to, and I didn't know what to look at, and I didn't know where to start. Oh, and um, researchers and researchers in 137 of the poorest nations in the world were depending upon me to figure out how to make this work for them. So I did. <laughs> and um, I did that with pretty much every technology challenge that I ever had. I buckled down, I figured it out, and I made it work. And then I moved to an institution who was working in the open source space and I suddenly was faced with a challenge that I didn't know how to navigate. For me, beginning to engage in open source spaces was the most alien thing I had ever done in my career. It was a closed system to me. There was no manual, there was no online resource, at least at the time, about open source spaces. Anything I could find was around various governance structures, rather than how to jump in. I couldn't figure out how to engage, how to have my voice heard, or how to participate. There was no how-to guide, and frankly, I was lost. Which led me to wonder, were others having the same issues that I was having? What was it about our structure that made it hard for me to engage? And as I started learning more about the world of open source, I began to see the value and the possibilities that are inherent here. I also saw that if we were serious about including institutions that aren't elite in our future, we needed to approach things a little bit differently. I started wondering and questioning and tilting at windmills, and I needed to remind myself that before we deconstruct our current system, we need to take a look at what's working in our communities 
and what isn't. In my role on the steering committee for Fedora and my work with Sam Vera, I had countless conversations lamenting the fact that we didn't know how to attract users from smaller schools, how to get museums to engage with us, et cetera, et cetera. This led me to wonder, what are developing world institutions using? And what, what are their thoughts on open source use and adoption? And are there parallels to engagement with communities who are underrepresented in these spaces? So what my research began to show was that cultural heritage institutions around the globe have embraced the idea of creating, supporting, and distributing open source software for a variety of reasons. Chief amongst these being that an existing vendor is unlikely to create the tools that are needed and that there is no real profit to be made through commercial interests or that the institutions creating the software feel strongly about not being beholden to an external vendor. In the cultural heritage space, we have experience with being held hostage to external forces and have firsthand experience with what can happen financially when you relinquish control over your assets and assets management systems. <coughs> Elsevier. <clears throat> As Edo Kumar, Malik Arjun, and Viral wrote in 2014, Rossi, Russo, and Giancarlo in 2012, and Daling and Rafferty in 2013, for some institutions, the commitment to researching, building, and sustaining these tools is worth the staff costs, and for many developing world institutions, the benefit of adoption outweigh the financial and human capital investments necessary for successful implementation. And as Chiguata wrote in 2018, these benefits include lower costs, no vendor lock-in, the ability to adapt and to innovate, robust user and developer communities, and affiliated discussion groups that support and surround them. So if developing world institutions like open source software, what's the problem, right? Well, Kamau and Namuye write about how despite the creation of organizations like the Free Software and Open Source Foundation for Software, FOSFA, say that five times fast, whose vision is to promote the use of free open source software and the FOSS model in African development corporations with proprietary software like Microsoft still have a stranglehold on the marketplace. Recognizing that their research primarily focused on desktop operating systems and general office applications, it is still possible to extrapolate from their review that the ease of use, availability of application and technical support, and absence of an adoption and procurement policy around open source software make adoption in the developing world difficult. These issues, though, are not unique to developing world institutions. In fact, these are the same reasons many institutions, like public libraries, smaller universities with limited IT staff in the United States, don't adopt open source software. Or if they do, they must do so through vendors, like Equinox, who provides service support for Koha um, and Evergreen, or Lyricis for archive space. So, Buwele and Ponelis in 2015, Uzomba, Oyebola, and Izuchukua in 2015 found a variety of major barriers to open source implementation of Koha, which falls into two major categories. The first being human challenges, such as lack of appropriate skills, lack of appropriate supervision and managerial support, insufficient manpower, lack of training and retraining opportunities, and cost of procurement. The second being the technical challenges like maintenance costs, lack of consortium to share the technical burden, lack of funding, lack of systematic implementation plans, lack of appropriate technical skills for customization and implementation, coupled with an issue that most of us don't have, erratic power supply. So Mishra, Vimal, and Jasmudian, Khan, and Mahmoud all talk about the lack of proper planning, the lack of cooperation, the lack of willing or appropriately trained staff, lack of standards, 
financial limitations, and lack of consultants as barriers to implementation. But another barrier to adoption is that open source software is often created by a single institution or a collection of a few institutions to meet local needs. Development of features and functions may expand beyond the initial implementers as the circle of adopting institutions grows, but regardless of how robust a community around a tool may be, contributing institutions are ultimately primarily concerned with meeting their own local needs rather than adapting the product to make it useful to the widest possible market. Vendors who wish to convert open source software tools into hosted fee-for-service offerings can bring a great deal of value in the marketplace by helping to reduce barriers to adoption, especially those associated with the high effort and high cost of installation and configuration. Yet the requirements and needs for offering open source software as an a la carte marketable service at scale can vary significantly from the base needs and pain points for which the software was originally developed, resulting in a noticeable feature gap. In order to bridge this gap and create a marketable product, vendors often must either assume the cost of development themselves or request the community do it for them. So while at Northwestern, I was the PI on an IMLS grant, which was designed to provide a pathway to, to sustainability for Avalon, a Samvera-based AV repository and de delivery system. One of the goals of the grant was to run a pilot of Avalon as a SaaS. Now, the team had built out and was running a production version of Avalon in AWS. Building out an AWS meant that there were dependencies created to optimize use of the architecture, like using Amazon's transcoding services rather than running our own local transcoder server. So we partnered with Lyricis on a pilot and identified a number of institutions to participate. So while the testing institutions generally liked Avalon and were hopeful that it would be rolled out as a service, we ran into a number of serious issues, both during the testing with Lyricis and afterward. At the time, Lyricis wasn't using AWS for their cloud architecture, causing a host of issues just to get the project off the ground. Like any new technology, there is a learning curve, and AWS's is fairly steep, and their staff tried to make things work in their existing architecture, and then had to quickly learn a new one once the decision was made to stick with what we knew would work. Once we completed the pilot, Lyricis came back with a long list of items that they needed us to build that were required for a minimum viable product in order for them to provide Avalon as a service. Now, what they requested were not items that institutions like Northwestern or, or our partner Indiana University needed, and because neither institution had any reason to advocate for building out tools for a vendor to provide a service that had no local, no local return on investment, we were never going to prioritize its creation. What we're effectively talking about is using hundreds of hours of developer time to create pathways for vendor benefit, which is a hard thing to justify to yourself, let alone your management team, when you already talk about open source software as for the greater good. Because ultimately, you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere for what you can and can't build. Now, within many open source software communities, it is a widely held belief that a project is successful once it has its vendors who work in that space. Working with vendors for customization, implementation, and training can be expensive, but can mitigate many of the barriers for implementation cited above. This quote from the It Takes a Village report sums it up quite well for me. Quote, working with vendors involves considerable requirements analysis on both sides. In the end, the service provider needs to develop the features in a way the implementing institutions can use, but that is generic enough that other organizations can use them too. If done well, these types of arrangements can provide a high level of community engagement while covering the costs of continuing to develop the software. End quote. As more and more vendors become comfortable with the tools necessary to provide good cloud-based services and support, 
Open source software adoption may increase as a path forward for institutions who are interested in using these tools, but who don't have the local infrastructure or staffing to support adoption. Yet exploring the question of adoption rates for open source software in the developing world requires looking a layer deeper than simply the availability of commercialized services. In her presentation, Privacy and Cross-Border Preservation-Based Partnerships at CNI in March of 2018, Erin Tripp spoke about the reluctance to use US-based providers for data storage, even if they have data storage centers in other countries. For example, the UK Data Protection Act says that data cannot be transferred outside of Europe, quote, without adequate protection. The ultimate issue is that, quote, all transfers of information create legal issues, particularly where the transfer is to a third party across borders. So on top of the legal issues associated, developing world institutions may be struggling with the history of colonialism that layers significant issues around, around trust on top of the legal issues identified with using cloud-based services for open source software delivery. Now, I have spoken in other venues about my concerns about strategic decision making for open source projects sitting in a local context. I'm gonna give you an example. So Northwestern University spent the last year that I worked there engaging in local and community-based software development sprints with the Samvera community in order to implement their local repository in AWS. While much of the work done during that time benefited the broader community and helps keep the code of the software current, Northwestern was primarily interested in improving their local workflows and demands by central administration to utilize cloud-based services. Not how any other institutions may do their own implementation. That was not their concern at all. Northwestern ultimately isn't in the business or isn't interested in offering Samvera as a service to other institutions, which can mean that the players within an open source software community may not always do the best job of taking a locally produced product and providing pathways for other institutions to use, what's create, to use what was created the same way, if at all. Let me rephrase that. Northwestern University made a decision to use Amazon Web Services, a cloud-based service provider used extensively in the United States. They spent significant time looking at the code within Samvera and peeling away services and using instead what AWS was offering. In theory, this is exactly how this should work. We as a community should be looking at new technologies and seeing how implementing them can increase efficiencies and improve services and user experience. Until I point out to you that outside of US-based international companies, AWS has almost no international users. Just think about that for a minute. One of the largest cloud providers in the world doesn't have much market share outside of the United States. Why? Well, in short, trust, or I should probably more accurately say lack thereof, because people don't trust the United States government to not go mucking about where they don't belong. Because while they haven't, they can demand it of US companies, and there is no guarantee that they won't comply. Stay strong, Apple. But so what, right? I mean, I've illustrated above that ultimately, the in institutions who invest in the creation of these infrastructures have to act selfishly at some point. It's not a bad thing that they do so. They can't be responsible for solving all the world's problems. They need to think about local needs because ultimately, the local institution is who pays their check. But what I've outlined above is that a single institution can make significant and potentially long tail changes to a product which could actually limit usage and adoption over time, not increase it. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about training and communication. So LaRue and Brashears and their work in rural South Africa argue that, quote, brief training workshops could significantly improve usage of open source software, even with a lack of exposure to similar technologies, end quote. While their article focuses on the use and adoption of citation management software, in this case Zotero, 
This statement is well corroborated when looking at implementations of larger software packages. Fedora, an open source repository system for managing and disseminating digital content, has been implemented by over 300 organizations in more than 35 countries. In 2018, Fedora held 11 training sessions for new and existing implementers. Of those 11 training sessions, four of them were held outside of the United States. One in Canada, two in Germany, one in Spain. In the prior year, two were held in Germany, two were held in the UK, and one was held in Japan out of 11 total trainings. Now, Fedora has regular committer calls, leadership calls, an open wiki, a Slack channel, an IRC channel, and a listserv. It is a relatively well-resourced project with dedicated staff to facilitate community management, technical development, and most recently, international outreach. Now, the Fedora com community has done a phenomenal job of making themselves open and welcoming, yet all of the documentation on the wiki is in English. All of the current committers are from North America, and all scheduled calls are designed to be easiest for North American users to participate. These are complex technical documents that require an understanding of English beyond the most basic abilities. We all make assumptions about how people learn. For example, Western culture puts value on the written word, but in other cultures, knowledge transfer might be better suited through mentorship, partnership, and other forms of personal human interaction and storytelling. This is not to pick on the Fedora project, which has been making a concerted effort to be more conscious of how to bring in users from across the globe. Most of the open source projects created by institutions in North America share similar characteristics. And while many of the volunteers within the Fedora community do this work as part of their day-to-day -day jobs, reliance on synchronous communication tools like Slack for asynchronous communication can cause major communication gaps. If there are multiple time zones for participants on a single project, no time of day works for everyone. Somebody will have to get up early, somebody will have to stay late. Professionally, this happens all the time. But this is a volunteer community with different rules for work, different expectations, different demands on time. So if you're trying to implement a local instance in Australia, the next person who may see your message may not be at work for another four to eight hours. And your message falls down the queue. But we need to acknowledge the necessity of back and forth conversation for troubleshooting while balancing the realities of work schedules and location of implementers. We need to be honest about these barriers because issues can pile up and lead to bad feelings and the sense that implementing certain solutions just isn't worth the hassle. Now, if you're in a multinational corporation, your job is to make yourself available at any hour. Not true in an all-volunteer community. In comparison, Koha off offers trainings all over the world and mechanisms for translation services. One could argue that Koha and Fedora are an apples and oranges comparison, as Koha is a library automation tool and therefore will have more local users than a tool like Fedora, which is a niche tool for supporting digital library activities. But the lessons remain constant. Koha is more successful with international implementations and implementations in the developing world because they have almost from the beginning focused on how to be the most inclusive type of organization they possibly can be. Now that said, the tools that both of these communities use make assumptions about users that can cause barriers to implementation and adoption. I mentioned when I started this talk that when I started working in open source software communities, I had no idea how to engage. I'm an intelligent, well-educated woman who has spent the entirety of my career needing to be better and smarter than my male colleagues for half of their respect. Now, Larsh, the systems admin who taught me how to set up and network Unix servers, made it clear to me that if I wanted to know something, then I needed to come to him or figure it out on my own every time I asked anyone for help in understanding anything, I would lose respect I didn't have. 
So I will tell you from personal experience, knowing how to engage in an open source software community is not a given. Feeling comfortable jumping in and asking questions no matter how open and non-judgmental you are as a community, doesn't necessarily translate. Communities all have norms and behaviors that are learned as you engage with those communities. We often ask users and implementers to just jump in and ask questions, but it's harder to jump in and risk looking or feeling stupid when you're a woman or a person of color or English is not your first language. Basically, a person who is already dealing with other systemic issues and biases inherent in our dominant culture. I will also say that the open source software world has a bit of a colonialist idea of who and what we are. We often say things like, we've created this amazing solution, come use it. How we present what we're doing and how we encourage discourse and engagement in our spaces needs to be incredibly thoughtful. Otherwise, we risk not being nearly as inclusive or open as we think we're being. So we need to rethink training. It's not just about bringing developers online. It's about acclimating people to the culture. Directors, librarians, project managers, programmers, researchers, end users, etc. We need to invest and create train the trainer programs that are flexible and reflective of a number of different learning styles. We need to train on how to engage in the community, how to deal with imposter syndrome as best we can, and cultural competencies. Think of it like the gardens of Versailles or Central Park in New York City. These are highly structured parks with sections where organic wildness is cultivated. We need to make our training and onboarding reflective of the need for both structure and chaos. We need language translation, but we also need people who are responsible for onboarding. We need to think creatively about asynchronous support mechanisms when we're not multinational corporate entities with global staffing models. Now, if I haven't said it before, I'll say it now. These tools we're building are complex and often have a steep learning curve associated with understanding their capabilities, let alone implementation and customization. We have different needs, even within higher ed in the United States, trying to come up with a single global solution is foolish to contemplate. We're trying to solve a variety of problems, access or embargoing access, digital preservation, delivery of data sets, AV materials, etc., and everybody's priorities are different. So in the face of it, projects like Semvera, DSpace, and Islandora may look very similar, and in many ways they are. But they all serve different constituencies and slightly different purposes. So the important thing isn't to try to pick one system that will rule them all, but to have them connect and talk to each other because interoperability is key. It is likely that a solution that serves the needs of Penn State, Michigan, and Stanford will, meet the will not meet the appropriate needs of a small liberal arts college, a large research intensive university, large museums, small museums, research centers, etc. So we really need to focus on balancing local needs with global efforts. So as I talked about earlier, there are significant potential pitfalls with coupling our open source software technologies with services provided through vendors like AWS, Google, or Microsoft. While there are significant local efficiencies gained by using AWS's transcoding technologies to deliver AV materials with a solution like Avalon, doing so and neglecting programming for alternative solutions not only unnecessarily constrains the software itself, it makes it more difficult for institutions outside of the United States to implement those solutions if they have data security concerns about using US or European-based cloud service providers. International thought leadership needs to be part of, decision, part of decisions around what gets added to core code to make sure a single institution or a single nation 
isn't painting an entire project into a corner. We need thought leadership around strategic decisions that affect both local and global progress. We need to do a better job of bringing our products to market by strategically partnering with our vendors. Now, there are a couple of big takeaways that I think we need to think about here. Now, there is no such thing as a single answer. The work we're doing in open source software spaces is complex. The work we're doing is expensive, and it's often thankless. And that while, while, while we do much of our work for the greater good, we also need to recognize and reconcile ourselves with the selfishness of our work. We need to be honest about the limitations we have and the priorities that are most important to us, often on a project by project basis. Now this one is probably going to be the hardest thing for you to hear me say, but I believe that the structures that we have created are inherently patriarchal and racist. Now, before you bite my head off for making that statement, I wanna be clear. I personally have benefited from those part patriarchal and racist structures. I am a product of those structures. And while I can stand here in front of you and talk about the possibility of a different path forward, I am as caught up in those structures as everyone else in this room. I'm not here to radicalize you or get caught up on a tangent on feminist theory, but if we want to have an honest conversation about what's holding us back, we need to recognize that money equals power, money equals access, and when the wealthiest institutions are the ones making the biggest investments and in building the structures for engagement, we need to take a moment to recognize that the structure itself may in fact be part of the problem. So there are two initiatives that I do wanna draw your attention to that are, in their own way, attempting to push at those structures. The first is IOI, or Investment in Open Infrastructure, which is an international initiative which, at its core, believes that the needs of our scholarly communities aren't being met by the existing, largely uncoordinated scholarly infrastructure. They argue that our scholarly infrastructure spaces are dominated by vendor products that take ownership of the scholarly process and data without appropriate governance and oversight from the communities that they serve. Fundamentally, they are looking to create a loosely connected global network of researchers, scholars, and information professionals who use tools and platforms that are designed to interoperate and complement one another in their efforts to share, discover, and collaborate. The goal is to do this in a way that allows, for example, the EU to decide if they want a collective or a national approach to, to participation and what that looks like for them based on their own needs, their own funding, and their own priorities. So it's not up to IOI to decide how people organize, but to encourage them to organize and to participate in the larger IOI network. Now as originally conceived, IOI will consist of two functions. One is an assessment and recommendation framework that will regularly survey the landscape of open scholarly infrastructure with respect to its functionality, usage, health, and financial needs and make funding recommendations for that infrastructure. Its second function will be to coordinate funds to follow those recommendations of the framework. Coordinating financial resources from institutions, agencies, and foundations. They will work to increase the overall funding available to emerging and critical infrastructure. Now, I personally have some concerns about IOI acting in the space of doing landscape surveys and making funding recommendations for infrastructure, as most of the people on the current IOI steering committee are scholars and not repository experts. But it's early days yet, and I say this as one of the few people on the steering committee with a technical background. That said, the underlying call based on the idea that scholars and scientists who generally work in the public interest have a need for more open infrastructure that mirrors their social focus is exciting and worth taking note of. So if you're looking for a rallying cry from our users that they want something different, you've got IOI. 
But you also have the conversations in the United States around care and fair. And the current call for public comment on desirable characteristics of repositories for managing and sharing data resulting from federally funded research. This is an opportunity for all of us who work in the open source software space to think about how we might be able to use the momentum of a group like IOI and these larger scholarly communi communication conversations to help think more broadly about our software strategies and how we can build more inclusive communities. So the second project I want to point your attention to is called Open Platform. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should make it clear that I am one of the PIs on that particular project. So in December 2018, a group of 17 American universities who are arguably the biggest financial contributors to open source software projects got together in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then again in February of 2019 at Northwestern, where as a group, they agreed to a commitment to developing and promoting sustainable interoperable infrastructure to safely and continuously manage academic, scientific, and cultural content. The purpose of which is to create coherence by increasing interdependence, by sharing the risk and bringing down collective costs through scale. Now they agreed upon three strategic areas or domains of activity. The first, structured services, partnerships, and alliances, is about what you would expect. It outlines the value in cultivating relationships between institutions, projects, communities, vendors, funders, and public and private enterprise to ensure long-term sustainability of our efforts. Facilitating incubation, shared service, and physical sponsorship of new projects, and innovation to reduce friction of startup and scaling also to reduce duplicative efforts while remaining committed to the core purpose and shared mission of the community, which is distinct from individual or institutional roles, perspectives, and personalities, and working to ensure inclusivity of voices and, pers and perspectives from all participants in the platform. Now the second and third domains are a little bit different. The first is standards, interoperability, and certifications which was called out a bit in the IOI call as well, but effectively open platform is interested in developing and promoting interoperability by weaving the software and technologies of the platform together, maintaining the credentialing standards that define compatibility with the open platform, which then allows any entity to contribute compatible tools and content. So effectively creating the glue in between the software and the communities. And that makes that part work as a whole. They're also interested in maintaining documentation of the components of the platform. In particular, the functions of the components with respect to the whole. And maintaining alignment with existing national and international standards. But the biggest difference is through fiscal stewardship and sustainability. The idea being that instead of splitting your $20,000 investment from pots A, B, and C, and then having to decide how much to disinvest when pot D comes along, to instead collect all of our contributions into a single pot, which then distributes resources to the communities to use to accomplish their goals, including operational excellence, core development, as well as innovation. It then reviews and evaluates the resources, the resource needs of the ecosystem, maintains regularly updated reports, and an overall picture of the resources flowing into the ecosystem's projects. Now at the center of these activities, the open platform maintains two core responsibilities. The first is articulating the message. But the second is pooling the risk by providing a bedrock for sustaining what is working a shared method for understanding and responsibly managing risk, a cushion for innovation, and a pathway to repurpose what hasn't worked. The point is not to create something totally new that exists in a vacuum, but to leverage existing structures and relationships to build something new. For example, IOI or open platform don't need to be the group who owns the standard of interoperability for our projects. That's something that IFLA can do. 
The standards don't have to be wholly created by us, but can in fact be meta standards that point to other standards to work. We don't need to create new shiny things to solve every problem, but we do need to rethink things like how we're distributing money, who gets a seat at the table, and how we make decisions around international, multi-institutional software projects. So I will end this talk by talking a little bit about my talk title. Now, I had some trouble coming up with a title. I have trouble naming things in general. I named my daughter George. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you had things like Talkie McTalkface and the talk that never ends, but um, I'm getting there, I promise. So I had spent the day, I sent the title to Stephanie thinking about the content of this talk. And I kept saying to myself, we're all a little bit crazy. All of us who do this work, we're all a little bit touched. We build these large scale, multi-institutional tools. We build these robust communities to support them. We invest millions in them, and we often still end up having the same conversations. We know the structures that we've created are flawed. We are human, after all. We know we want and need to build out and rest control, rest control of aspects of the scholarly communication landscape from the vendors who are not engaging with us in a thoughtful and preferably collaborative way. And we know we have a limited time frame to do so. In high school, I spent a summer closing logging roads and clearing hiking trails in the Cascades. If you've ever done this kind of work, your focus is on what's immediately in front of you. You enjoy nature, but you're not thinking about whether moving this log will cause issues further down the path. I keep looking at the work we're doing here and thinking, we think we're taking this trail and turning it into a road. We think we're keeping the path clear and graded that we're tending our trees, and this trail will last 100 years and be used by millions. But what I see is a constant erosion of the trail. We haven't paid attention to the fact that farther up the, tree, uh, farther up the hill, the trees have been cut and we're dealing with erosion. Or someone built a house and has changed the way the water flows, wreaking havoc throughout the system. We invest, then we pull out, and put our limited resources elsewhere. We forget we have to shore up this section of the trail if we want the trail to work. We disinvest in maintaining aspects of the trail because it's not useful to us locally. This is our right, and I'm not negating that, but suddenly that portion of the trail collapses, and the farmhouse down below is suddenly dealing with a landslide because we made a choice and others made choices and we had no checks and balances or other forms of support available to make sure that the trail doesn't lose integrity. We build communities, invite people to use what we've created, and then we walk away. We need to do better. If we want to have the public trust us, we need to figure out a way to make ourselves worthy of that trust. My biggest concern about our future in the information landscape is simple. We keep making stupid choices. We've allowed ourselves creative and intellectual, we've allowed our, our creative and intellectual output to be sold back to us for ludicrous amounts of money, and we put up walls and told our citizens, you can't read what your tax dollars paid for. We have an opportunity right now to take it back, or at least to find a way to share things more equitably. Nobody is saying the corporations don't deserve to make a profit. But we need to think differently because we're facing off with vendors who boast 30% profit margins and a desire to own the knowledge landscape. We have to figure out new ways of competing, creative, collaborative, and potentially horribly bureaucratic. I hope that what I've laid out today makes you think. I hope you do more than poke holes, but instead try to help figure out a new path. We know what we've got isn't working quite right. And eating our young doesn't help us move forward. It just makes us less relevant. And crazy, because we keep doing the same thing and expecting it to be better this time. So with that, I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes by Mahatma Gandhi. 
be the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you.